production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly. And our topics this time, a Plaza Hotel wants another tax. Hillary wants better poll numbers. And Steve Rose wants some conservatives to win in November. And yes, you heard that last one correctly. Plus, roast and toast. But we start with our interview segment and focus on Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, home of the Army Command and General Staff College, typically referred to as CGSC. It's a training ground for U.S. military officers who have the potential to serve in high-ranking positions. The college also helps train military personnel from countries around the world. An adjunct of the college is the CGSC Foundation, designed to help advance the profession of military art and science by promoting and supporting the educational programs of the institution. Here to talk about the college and the foundation is Foundation Trustee Wes Westmoreland. Wes, welcome to Ruckus. Thank you. A uh, famous last name, we can't deny that. <laughs> Are you related to the famous General William Westmoreland? Yes, uh, my grandfather and him were cousins, and um, I, uh, absolutely, yeah. Did you know him at all? I did not, no. I'm, I'm young, uh, younger uh, than uh, that generation, yeah. I think. So. Uh, he was very famous during the Vietnam era mm -hmm. as a commander in Vietnam, and later for suing CBS News right. in a big libel case that was ultimately settled out of court. Let's talk about the Command and General Staff College at Absolutely. Fort Leavenworth. How would you describe it to people who have no idea what it is, never been in the Army or the military? I'm glad we started with that because I, I think uh, for most uh, that hear of Fort Leavenworth, I think they think of a prison. And I think that uh, that is uh, commonly uh, the first uh, thing you go to. but. Uh, it's critical that we get out, uh, not only to, the, to our local community here, but, uh, but nationally, uh, what this college is and what it does for our nation, uh, not only our nation, but, but globally. Um, so the, the college is a army college, but uh, allows uh, officers from uh, all lines of the military, not only in this country, but across uh, uh, the world. Each of our allied nations allows for one of their officers to attend uh, a year's college here. Uh, typically they go back and you give them 10, 15 years and they become uh, leaders of that country, uh, whether they're generals or uh, prime ministers, presidents. I know uh, one prime minister of a country uh, that attended uh, here just had a state dinner with the president. And uh, uh, part of his speech was uh, centered around his experiences in the United States. And, uh, that was uh, his experience at the command college. A lot, of, a lot of famous generals have gone through there. Uh, Eisenhower, Patton, MacArthur, right. David Petraeus, right. Colin Powell, among many that uh, mm -hmm. have, have come through uh, the command and general staff college. I think you, they're handpicked. I, I think uh, they're the rising stars and they're selected yeah. to, to but for we secondary. We often don't recognize their names while they're at Fort Leavenworth. Right. We, exactly. we recognize who they are uh, a decade or so later. Mm -hmm. What about the foundation? What does it do? But we simply provide support for uh, whatever the college may need. Uh, let's say, uh, for example, uh, the International Officers uh, Gala is this Friday. Uh, we are uh, bringing them in, uh, really putting on uh, the gala that, at, at the Kaufman that we have once a year. And it's a, an event to welcome uh, uh, really to allow our community to welcome these international officers. Uh, so events like that. Uh, 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 well, and you've got the Art of War exhibition that we want correct. to talk about. What, what is exactly is So that? the Art of War is a collection of gifts that have been given to the college by international officers since 1943. Uh, the first gift is, uh, was from Poland, uh, and uh, I think there's some significance there. Uh, in May of 1943, uh, a, a, Polish uh, uh, officer was studying there right before, uh, as we know, everything really yeah. started to, to heat up. Uh, but well, they're the showing some video of it now. Okay. And if somebody wants to see it, 
Yeah, is it, it's, it's is it open Todd, to the public? Yeah, absolutely. It's at Todd Weiner's Art Gallery in the Crossroads. And uh, Todd and his team have selected from 3,800, a little over 3,800 items, one from each decade. And each piece has significance for that decade. So since uh, the early 40s till present, uh, there's a piece that really symbolizes, I believe, what that decade was about, not only for uh, our army, but this nation, and, and for this, this uh uh, planet. Yeah. If somebody wants more information about the foundation, what should they do? Uh, simply go to www.cgscfoundation.org. All right, great. Wes, yeah. thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure to meet you. Good luck with your projects. Great meeting you. Thank you very much. That's Command and General Staff College Foundation Trustee Wes Westmoreland. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens is head of Rock Hill Strategic. Steve Rose is a Johnson County civic leader and a Kansas City Star columnist. Mary O'Halloran is a media and communications consultant. And Patrick Tuohy is field manager at the Show Me Institute in Kansas City, a libertarian think tank. Good to see all of you again. Thanks for coming in. So when is a tax not a tax? Well, apparently when Kansas Cityans don't have to pay it. That's the essence of a plan being studied by the City Council in Kansas City to allow the Intercontinental Hotel on the plaza to raise its sales tax by one cent for 20 years, mostly imposed on patrons visiting Kansas City. <clears throat> Excuse me. The money would be used to help pay for a $16 million renovation. Now, before the tax can take effect, the Council must declare the four-star hotel blighted. That's a prelude to creating a CID, Community Improvement District, where the tax would be imposed. This at a time when the council is seriously discussing cutbacks in various tax abatement programs, such as tax increment financing, TIFs. So Patrick, what should the typical ruckus viewer deduce from all this talk about blight, TIFs, and SIDS? Well, it's inescapable that Kansas City tax policy is a farce. <coughs> Uh, we uh, divert uh, millions of dollars each year to developers like this, to hotels like this, and as a result, we uh, don't have enough money to provide basic city services. Uh, that idea that the Intercontinental, a luxury hotel, it's got four stars, I think, uh, in most rating services, uh, is, is blighted and needs uh, public funds uh, to renovate itself is, is really an embarrassment. And in fact, other hotels are watching closely because if if the Intercontinental gets it, they're going to be next in line asking for it as well. All right. So I promised I would ask John the same question. <laughs> I suspect John will have a different answer. Well, what should, well let me ask yeah, the question all first. Right, all right. What should the <laughs> typical viewer deduce from all this talk about blight, sure. tiffs, and SIDS? I think there's a lot of confusion. The reality is community improvement districts, transportation development districts, TIFs, they're, they are effective. They do work. However, in this case, aligning it with a luxury hotel only, it taints the well of public opinion. It certainly feeds into this idea that all of it is a farce. And I would agree. I think this is a misguided uh, use of a CID and should absolutely not move forward. Well, Steve, you've been a businessman for a lot of years in the Kansas City area. Don't businesses need this kind of help if they're going to progress? Well, they've done a lot of CIDs in Johnson County, and they have been extraordinarily successful. They've taken shopping centers that were run down, not run down, but they had seen better days, let's put it that way. And with the CID, they, the developer came in, spent a lot of money, and by golly, the centers really improved. Uh, now, we're talking about naming a hotel blighted, <laughs> Uh, I think it's time they just withdraw the request because there's no way this is going to fly. And if it did fly, as Patrick said, we'd have everybody, every hotel in Kansas City would want the same deal. Mary, you might remember one of the earliest <laughs> TIFs granted in Kansas City. I know I remember this was when the Nichols Company wanted it. Miller Nichols was running J.C. Nichols at the time, and he got uh, a TIF to build a garage at the then Neptune Apartments. So it's not something new that we I'm have tips on the I'm not real familiar with the garage at the Neptune apartments. Like. Mary, you didn't bone up on this. <laughs> but, but I am very familiar with uh, requests for big tax abatements on the plaza. I used to live on the plaza, and when I did, that's why I thought you might be familiar the with all this. Sailors project uh, began, and it was asking for the old 353. The, yeah. You know, it was all blighted. And Winstead's was blighted, according to those developers, and we fought. Once and then won, and we fought again, and we won. 
and we uh, pr we uh, uh, got half or 75 percent of the taxes for schools out of that development that you now see on the corner of, uh, of uh, uh, Brush Creek Boulevard. So this just doesn't really, I don't think the taxpayers are going to are, think well of the political uh, class if they, if they grant this because uh, those rooms can be improved can by Can anything owner. be made of the argument this would be paid mostly by out-of-town people? Uh, yeah, well, certainly that's what uh, Kansas City likes to argue. It's free to us. We're, <laughs> we're going to charge other well, people. Well, it's not really free if you go in and have a drink or well, a dinner. Sure. But, but there is a cost even if you never step foot in the hotel because uh, if the Intercontinental were to raise its rates 1%, uh, it would pay tax on that income. But by using a CID, it doesn't have to pay tax on that income. So once again, Kansas City may be losing out on tax revenue. And, and one other thing I want to talk about, when people look at these tax policies and say, well, look what happened as a result, it's a basic logical fallacy. These things would have happened anyway. Uh, but what the developer says is, look, yeah. you well, gave us a, a, a well, business the, has to the refresh its facilities. That's just, the that's just not true. Yeah, that's that's not, I don't care what the research tells you. I, well, I'll tell you <laughs> in real life. <laughs> well, see, in real if life, if you don't care what the research, research tells you, then well, no, we your, have no discussion. Well, it's Patrick, your research. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the University of Chapel Hill. It's, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It worked. Patrick, I want to ask you one more question. They're talking about a reduction in. Are you through, Mary? So I can go on. They're talking about a reduction in TIFs from 100% to 75 and then down to 375 is that plan likely to succeed? I have no idea how likely it is to succeed. The Would you like to see plan, it succeed? Well, the problem with the plan is it's got so many loopholes and backdoor and emergency clauses that will likely be rendered useless. This is, but, a, this is a city council that <laughs> declares emergency to pass all sorts of things. But you would acknowledge that Clinton Lucas has done wonderful right. work on this subject, wouldn't you? Uh, well, I don't know. Quentin Lucas votes for things. He he, he hand rings no. about, for example, the Crown Center <laughs> compromise. Uh, the the Crown on. Center tiff, but then votes for it. It's not enough to say this is a bad idea. We need a council that actually says no. Quentin Lucas is the third district at That's large right. councilman in Kansas City, Missouri. In case you were wondering, it is probably not the ideal compliment, but it's not exactly an insult either. In his most recent column, Steve Rose writes, "It would be easy and wrong." to demonize all conservative Republicans in the Kansas legislature because so many of them are crazies. <laughs> he finds three who are apparently in full possession of their faculties, all live in and represent Johnson County. The three are Senator Jim Denning and Representatives Ron Rickman Jr. and Marvin Klebe. Apparently the difference between conservative sanity and conservative crazy in the Rose Doctrine is a willingness to compromise Equally important, all three are or might be in positions of leadership when the legislature convenes next year. So, Steve, what prompted writing this column at this time? Well, people started voting early in October, October the 19th, so it's time to start talking about the races that are occurring and where the important, uh, important decisions are made. Uh, one of the things you left out, Mike, when you said all that you said is that with that leadership position, with those positions that the three would hold, and they will, the Republicans are going to maintain a majority, and let's put, they choose the leadership. These people are going to end up in leadership positions. These three people will write, literally write, the school finance formula that will determine how Johnson County schools are treated. In 1992, they weren't treated very well when they, do, when they came up with the formula. So if for no other reason than that, I think the people of Johnson County should vote for these particular conservatives. I'm not wild about the other conservatives that are running, and they are, many of them are crazy, but I, I think these are three that are not. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, Steve, you know, as, as much as I understand where your column is coming from this time, I, I just, you know, what's happening in the state. Uh, as everybody knows, is that finally people are standing up and they are voting for change in Topeka because they understand the budget. We're broke. And, and the, the giant decision about how to turn this thing around before one can hardly imagine what other catastrophe could strike. So the idea that you should vote these guys in because it, the, the uh, primaries produced enough change. Look, Jim Denning running uh, this time. 
and has been there, voted for the sales tax increase. He voted for the block grants. He voted for the tax cuts. He voted in lockstep with Brownback every single time well, the, on the, every major issue. Yeah. And, and in addition to that, well, well, well I think we got the point. He thinks he'll do good work for Johnson <laughs> County, you, which I thought I implied yeah. in the introduction yeah, by yeah, no, saying they did. live there yes, and did. that they will be in leadership positions. But what about calling conservatives, most of the conservatives in Kansas, crazies. Is that analogous to Hillary's basket of deplorable? You know, it, it's a sign of the times, unfortunately. The, the editorial writers at the Kansas City Star, and, and Steve's not the only one, uh, cluck their tongues, call people names. Uh, uh, you know, Yale Abu Halka on Twitter condemned the NRA to hell. Uh, and yet they all complain about Trump. Well, they are Trump. This is what politics has become. And, and the other problem I had with Steve's uh, column was that it, it didn't talk about any principles. The, the, apparently that the principle we ought to be organizing around is simply uh, compromise, which, which really is just a matter of defeat. I think people want to uh, <laughs> push for their values. Uh, they want things that they can sink their teeth into, and it's not just a matter of process. Jo John, I don't think we'd call you a conservative. I don't know in depth your political views, but from our few encounters on <laughs> Ruckus, I would say you're not a conservative. What do you think of when somebody says a candidate is a conservative? I like to think that it means well-reasoned economic policy, conservative policies related to the economy that are well-reasoned and thoughtful and benefit the citizens. I think, unfortunately, we have reached a point and we've watched the state of Kansas. I won't call anyone crazy, but I will say that we watched this last legislature in Kansas drive Kansas off of a cliff and put them, put the state and its citizens in a terrible exactly. position. And I think that's where we, if we do have some hope with the conservatives and otherwise in the legislature, it's gonna be that there have been so much response to this that they have to close the LLC loophole. They have to find an adequate funding formula for schools and move forward. A couple of quick points, Steve. Over in Missouri, uh, the legislature has overridden the governor's veto of requiring a photo ID to vote. It will go on the ballot in November if passed by voters. It will become law. Otherwise, it will go elsewhere. It won't become the law. Also, uh, there was a veto override by the legislature on the question of gun control. Concealed weapons no longer do you have to have training or get a permit to own a handgun in the state of Missouri. It doesn't say you can't have training. It just says you don't have to have. Your reaction to those two actions by the legislature? Well, I, for one, don't think it's such a big deal to ask people for a voter for a, a, a motor uh, driver's license when you're going to vote. I do think it's a huge deal, which is what happens in Kansas when you ask people to provide a passport or a birth certificate in order to register to vote. I think that's. I think the courts but, are going to. But be, that's not what this is. This, this no, says this to is vote, not, you have to have a photo ID. Is, if you don't have one, exactly. you can sign a piece of paper. I don't think that. And the state will get deal. you one. Right, exactly. And pay for whatever it costs I, to find I, your I, background. I agree. I don't think it's an unreasonable request. So, in Kansas, request. you show your voter ID, you right. show a photograph, and people do that just, without too much concern, I think. Right. On the guns, you know, they're just catching up with Kansas, and <laughs> soon Kansas is going to have yeah, really. the ability for people to walk on a college campus or in the emergency room at the KU hospital with guns. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just crazy. Patrick, what's the, crazy. what's the, yes. what, what's, really crazy. Crazy. what's just quick, crazy. quickly, what's <laughs> Jay Nixon's legacy? I think he's a placeholder governor. Okay. Uh, I think he may have had a lot of promise years ago, but people look at him now and they're really not impressed with any legacy he might no, have. No political future for him, do you well, think? I, I can't imagine. They <laughs> talked about him years ago as a possible uh, you know, vice oh, presidential, vice presidential candidate. Oh, but there is a political future for the next one. Well, Mr. Coster's coming, right? Or up. Mr. Greitens, we don't know yet. No, we don't. <laughs> no, we don't. But. Even the most rigid Republican would likely acknowledge that Hillary Clinton's credentials for the presidency are impeccable. Ivy League Law School, eight years as First Lady, service in the U.S. Senate, and four years as the nation's Secretary of State. One might reasonably expect that the Democratic Party's presidential nominees' poll numbers would dwarf those of Donald Trump, who has never been elected to anything or ever served in public office. Yet the most common sentence being uttered these days by political observers seems to be, the polls are tightening. And they are. What's Hillary's problem, Mary? Why is she not coasting to victory? <laughs> what, Hillary, what's Hillary's problem? Look, the country is close now. We're getting closer to the, every day that we get closer to the election. More people make their decisions and decide which direction they're going. And that's always the case. The polls always tighten as we get closer to the actual election day, except in those years where we had 
just overwhelming right. uh, uh, Well, but landslides. I think it's fair to say people were <coughs> saying ever. generally at the outset of this campaign, she's going to overwhelm him, it's going to be a landslide, well, he has no chance. That's not my point of view, Mike. I, I never thought that the first woman to run for president was just going to sweep into office. Never. Particularly uh, someone who has, you know, served long enough to really get Republicans attacking her for 20 years in one way or another. And it's not any different now. Mr. Trump has been underestimated by well, all the Republicans. Well, can we find out the uh, answer to my question? Why is she not doing better? Well, I, I Why is she not 20 it. points ahead? <laughs> well, I think because the, the polls always get closer, or are there other problems? I think the polls always get closer, but I also think that the country is is inherently divided, regardless of the candidate right now. You look at that; I think the polls would be closer, regardless of the two candidates on stage. However, I also think that um, Pete, Clinton is is held to the standards of a politician in the media, and uh, there's a narrative of distrust that. Some rightfully deserve, most of it not deserved, whereas Trump is held by the standards of reporting as an entertainer. You know, she, and that's fundamentally Hi different. Hillary deserves to lose this election because she is, she is a liar and she's not oh. to be trusted, but she's going to win. She's going to probably win handily in the end because people are going to judge which one they want, and I believe that Trump is going to be the man out. I think it's going to be Hillary. The man who has founded a real clear politics says Trump is gaining more acceptance among white people with college educations. Do you find that to be the case? I, I have As I, one? I watch the polls that, that uh, 538 comes on Nate Silver, yeah. yes. and, and he is not saying that. And he's, he yeah. gets them right almost every time. Actually, Mike, that, the, the, the uh, group that you just mentioned is the main reason why Hillary Clinton is as far ahead as she is, that more white college educated people are moving to the Democratic uh, side of the side of the aisle. How Let me just say what Nate Silver says about the race. He's got it at 76 to 24 percent, and that's a prediction on the likelihood that she will win. The New York Times at 64 to 36. So my but, but the polls now are showing in, in some of the battleground states like yeah, Florida sure. and Ohio, yeah, of course. Trump is either ahead or very close behind what's going on. Well, uh, I'll, I'll agree with Steve on this. She's, she's not transparent. Uh, well, how about the Colin Powell emails and the whole email oh, scandal? Well, those are devastating. Even people who are supposedly I mean, the, the, the defense was Colin Powell did it, and Colin Powell clearly says in emails that he says are in fact his, he did not do that. Do you want an answer? Yeah. <laughs> no, I just want to add. The, 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 irony, <laughs> the irony of the whole Colin Powell uh, episode is that you're absolutely right. Hillary tried to throw him under the bus by saying the email was his idea. However, because he used unsecured email, it was hacked, and now we are learning what he really thinks. But that's thinks his private it. email. That's, not, that's right. not government. What does he but think about Hillary, Mike? He doesn't think he about likes her better than yes, he likes he does. Trump. And what right. does he think about Trump? He doesn't that he's like a national it at all. disgrace right. and an well, international Well, I didn't say pariah. he did like him. I was just simply no. saying, which is correct, that he has now denied that he told Hillary Clinton used the, government one of facilities the main reasons for classified Mr. Trump information. has gotten by with really lying. You want to talk about lying, Steve? Is that the, he is entertaining, and the and the media has an interest okay, in we, a close we, race. We've got to go and out of time. Now we head to the soapbox for roast and toast, where the ruck gets flatter or batter. People and events in the news. Let me start with John. Sure. My toast is to the NCAA for following through on a promise of hosting championship events in communities that are inclusive. By removing seven events recently from North Carolina uh, due to HB2, uh, the rightfully maligned organization did get this one right. Uh, I hope that the Missouri and Kansas legislatures look at this when they're considering things like SGR 39 in the future. Uh, it's wrong policy, it's wrong for business, and it's wrong for the communities that like Kansas City. And Mary. Uh, who could help <laughs> roast uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, yesterday? The most recent big lie that he's trying to tell is that Hillary Clinton hasn't worked on child care as an issue, has, isn't not, hasn't now, doesn't have anything on her website, and won't help people who need child care, uh, families who need it in the future. It's, not a, it's just an amazing thing to watch this man look into the camera and lie at that level. Hillary Clinton is acknowledged worldwide as one of the world's experts on this subject. 
Her plan on ch her child care in the United States improvements in it has been on her website for a year and a half. Got to wrap it up, Steve. My toast is to Reverend Adam Hamilton, who presides over the Church of the Resurrection, which is the largest United Methodist Church in the in the country, with 20,000 uh, parishioners, and he has just been named and will be receiving the award in November, Johnson Cannon of the Year, because the church does a lot more in the community than people realize, and I hope it comes to light. Patrick. Well, my roast today is for Clay and Platt counties uh, for violating the spirit, certainly if not the letter, of Missouri's open records law. Uh, over the past few weeks, the Show Me Institute has been investigating property values in Kansas City to demonstrate that, in fact, all the development we've paid for has gone for naught. And Jackson County provided us the information we requested for $25, but Clay and Platt County asked $2,400 and $1,200 respectively. The first duty of government is to be transparent and to share records, and Clay and Platt counties are falling down on that job. And finally, here's a roast to Hillary's husband whose hypocrisy apparently knows no bounds. Talking about the Donald Trump slogan, Make America Great Again, Bill Clinton said, the phrase is actually racist and implies support for a return to the days when racism ran rampant. Apparently, Bill has a short memory. I believe that together we can make America great again. I want to attack these problems and make America great again. To secure a better future for your children and your grandchildren and to make America great again. It's time for another comeback. Time to make America great again. That message where I'll give you America great again. And that's Ruckus for this week. See you back here next Thursday. Thanks for watching and good night.